This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. At least four killed in an explosion in Benghazi, where Libya's LNA commanders were attending a funeral. Shiite protesters hold demonstrations for the third day in both Lagos and Abuja to demand release of their leader. And regional body EGOD in new efforts to broker settlements in Kenya-Somalia maritime disputes. Hello and welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us. I'm Richard Sterling Ta, live in Nairobi. And for those of you joining us from across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for joining us. And tonight, I'm alongside my colleague, Panina, who has our business headlines. Panina. Thank you, Richard. Coming up in Africa Live Business. Online sports betting firms in Kenya take a hit as government orders Safaricom to cut their mobile money payments. And tourism revenues in Tunisia rise by more than 40% in the first half of 2019. I'll be back with details of those stories and plenty more in just a bit. For now, Richard, back to you. Thank you, Panina. We begin in Libya, where a deadly explosion in Benghazi has killed four and wounded 33 others, according to an Interior Ministry spokesperson from the country's East Base government. A car bomb went off near a group of leaders from the Libya National Army. Senior officials, including the commander of the LNA Special Forces, were gathered for the funeral of a former military leader. The ministry spokesperson says that none of the military leaders were killed or injured. However, fatalities included two civilians and two soldiers. The wounded include civilians, army personnel and police. Since April, the self-styled Libyan National Army has been attempting to capture the Libyan capital Tripoli and overthrow the UN-backed Tripoli government. All right, let's get you more from that story. CGTN's Adel El Marui joins us from Cairo. Adel, thank you for joining us here on Africa Live. First things first, Adel, any word on who orchestrated the attack? No one yet has claimed responsibility. And it seems um, from the style of the attack itself that it could be uh, one of um, two groups, I either ISIL, which has been quite active in the south, especially after both Libyan governments have been very busy since April in fighting each other um, over the capital, Tripoli, after uh, LNA um, leader Khalifa Haftar, General Khalifa Haftar, launched a military offensive against um, Tripoli. Um, the fighting there has made ISIL increase significantly its influence and its strength in southern Libya has been quite active in recent weeks and months, um, and, and this is not actually the, one of the. This is not the first attack of such a kind of hearing explosions or um, a, a, a car bomb to be detonated in Libya. So it has, most of all, the style that we're used to see ISIL doing in Libya, or it could be Al Qaeda as well. Both of them have um, declared um, their um, an enmity or their uh, rivalry against Khalifa Haftar, who they believe is against the Islamists in the western side and in Tripoli. Um, so no confirmation yet, but most likely from the style, it's one of these two. Well, speaking of Khalifa Haftar, do we know whether the LNA leader Haftar was in attendance at the funeral when the venue was hit? No news at all have been released about his presence, his well-being, whereabouts, or anything. It was quite um, partic uh, peculiar to see that nothing has been referred, neither he's safe, neither he didn't attend, or um, he's not. So this is still a vague area, but at least uh, from what we're getting from official reports and from um, insider sources within the LNA um, um, uh, and its eastern uh, government, uh, it doesn't appear that Khalifa Haftar has been involved, at least not yet. But what we know also is that, as you've mentioned earlier, no prominent military general uh, from the LNA forces has been harmed. 
uh, which is an indication that the explosion itself may have hit part of the funeral, whether it is uh, quite far away or remote from um, the leaders and those who are first in line in such a funeral. The funeral was for um, General Al Mismari, um, fraught with the same family that um, Ahmed Al Mismari, the spokesman of the LNA, comes from. There have been some unconfirmed news that um, Ahmed Al Mismari's son was injured uh, in this blast. I'm still waiting for further confirmation about the key and prominent uh, figures of the LNA forces, especially Khalifa Haft. All right, Adele, my final question to you, though, before I let you go. In relation to the ongoing standoff between Haftar's forces and the UN-backed Libyan government forces, how significant is this hit on Benghazi? It is very um, big. It, is, it shows how vulnerable Benghazi is. Benghazi was one of the main areas where Haftar has been steadily um, showing his influence, has been basing his um, uh, presence, his offices, uh, and his military command there. Um, so just by having such a blast with such a magnitude, um, it is quite um, shocking at first, and also it is quite alarming. It, and this may, may be one of the main reasons why such group, whoever did it, um, is doing that, which again moves us back to the same style of ISIL, is to show that it is capable of doing um, a, a blast within a safe area to just uh, stand or give it a mark that it is not safe and those who are in that city are, do not have actual control over it. Um, so that's why it is very big. Uh, Khalifa Haftar has recently lost Ghiryan city, which was the main um, city for supporting, supplying his uh, military forces against against um, Tripoli with the campaign he announced to seize control over Tripoli. Ghirian has fallen into the GNA forces, um, the government of National Eckert, as you said, also backed by the United Nations and has international recognition. Uh, with such um, uh, instabilities appearing in Benghazi, um, it could be alarming. The, re the reaction, of course, from the LNA forces will be fierce. Um, there might be further attacks on Benghazi. It's still not clear how exactly um, the, the, the magnitude of penetration that groups such as ISIL or any other terrorist organization has inside Benghazi. So this is a key development in the stability of what has been believed as a very secure place, at least from the Eastern government perspective. All right, Adel El Marui talking to us from Cairo. Thank you for bringing us this story. We appreciate your insights. Now, from Libya to Nigeria, where members of the Shia religious sect, otherwise known as the Islamic Movement of Nigeria, are demanding the release of their leader, Ibrahim El Sasaki. They have taken their protests to the streets of Lagos and Abuja. These protests come on the head and heels of a violent confrontation between members of the Shia sect and the policemen at the country's parliament complex in Abuja just two days ago. CGTN's Daniela Pearson reports. Let's take a look. Hundreds of Shias have been demonstrating in the Nigerian cities of Abuja and Lagos. This comes just days after clashes with the police left at least two people dead. The protesters are demanding the release of their jailed leader, Ibrahim El Zagzaki. El Zagzaki has been arrested for the past four years now without any offense. And the court of law has granted him bail. And the government and the president who, had, who swear, who swear to, to adhere to the constitution of Nigeria has refused to obey the court. Zagzaki has been in government custody since 2015. Despite a number of court orders granting Zagzaki bail, the government has not released him. They say that he is in protective custody with his family. The protesters are also appealing to one of Nigeria's politicians. Lagos had always set a standard for fighting for human rights. And that is why we felt that we should come here and speak first to Lagosians. But secondly, we also need to speak to Ashwajubola Ahmed Tinubu. Ahmed Tinubu is a person that has one of the highest stake in the present democratic dispensation in Nigeria. If you have 21 million followers, and your followers gather one 1,000 naira each. That is 21 billion solid naira. If we were people that want war, we could buy 21 billion naira worth of weapons. But we are peaceful people. Our leader has taught us to be people of peace, and we love Nigeria, 
and we do not want anything bad to happen to our country. The detention of Zakzaki has led to repeated protests in Abuja and several northern cities. The Islamic Movement of Nigeria is a group that represents Nigeria's minority Shia Muslims. The group says that it will continue protesting until they secure the release of their leader. Daniela Pearson, CGTN. Tunisian fishermen have declared a health and humanitarian crisis following the recent drowning of 82 migrants from sub-Saharan Africa. The men say they cannot go on with their day-to-day -day work of fishing because they are not authorized to collect the corpses. The angry fishermen say they will protest so as to impose the decent burial of the undocumented victims. Tunisian fishermen in the coastal city of Zerzis say they can no longer work off the coast in the Mediterranean basin because the bodies of African migrants are everywhere. The corpses of 15 victims who drowned last week were recovered, but fishermen say hundreds of bodies are spread in the area. The Tunisian Libyan coast is full of dead bodies. I've seen between 400 and 500 corpses. Many died off Libya and have been transported by the waves to as far as 18 kilometers off Zarzis. The scene is horrific and the pungent smell of decomposing bodies makes fishing impossible. The Zarzis Fisherman Union has condemned the reaction of the authorities, especially in Italy. Many Tunisian captains say they could be jailed in Italy for saving migrants or recovering their corpses. Tunisian fishermen do not have the logistical means and the authorization to collect the bodies of undocumented African migrants. It's forbidden by law. Europeans and the so-called Democrats and rights activists reject migrants alive or dead. It's unacceptable to treat humans as such. The International Organization for Migration assisted four male survivors. One of the men, a 29-year-old national from Cote d'Ivoire, suffering from hypothermia, died in hospital in Zerzis. Tunisia is Libya's neighbor. Libya has become a platform for irregular migration and high-risk boat departures due to instability. One migrant out of three drowns. There could be more undocumented accidents. The recent drowning of migrants is a tragedy that Tunisia cannot solve alone. The three survivors of the recent tragedy in the Mediterranean are from Sub-Saharan Africa. Two are hospitalized and one is in a shelter run by the Tunisian Red Crescent. According to the National Guard spokesman, 71 irregular migrants of different nationalities were rescued this week off Kirkina while attempting to cross to the Italian island of Lampedusa on board of a makeshift boat. They sailed from the Libyan city of Zuara. Authorities say this incident confirms that the flow of migrants will not stop. Adin Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Russian President Vladimir Putin says he hopes negotiations brokered by Norway will help bring an end to the political turmoil in Venezuela. We hope the talks between the Venezuelan government and opposition that have started with the assistance of Norway will help find solutions that are agreeable to everyone in Venezuela and normalize the situation in the country. Well, meanwhile, the United States has imposed sanctions against Venezuela's military counterintelligence agency. It follows the death in custody of a Navy Captain Rafael Acosta, who was arrested for alleged participation in a coup plot. Acosta's family say he was tortured to death. Venezuela's chief prosecutor says two intelligence officials have been charged with homicide. You are watching Africa Live on CGTN. The news continues. We have a lot more coming your way, including. Focus on Africa's most populous nations as world marks Population Day. And witnesses describe scenes that left at least six people dead in a violent storm at popular Greek tourist destination. Africa the most iconic wildlife destination in the world. Its unique ecosystems were formed over countless eons. Many people can only dream of visiting this natural paradise. But now, for the first time ever, CGTN Wild Wonderland Live Show is bringing Africa to you through all of our online platforms. 
14 episodes from July 22nd to 28th take you to adventure through the Great Plains of Kenya's Masai Mara, the Serengeti in Tanzania, and the Greater Kruger Park in South Africa. Welcome aboard the wildest ride of a lifetime. This is Wild Wonderland Live Show, only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Seven people have been killed in a violent storm that swept across northern Greece on Wednesday night. Hal Kidiki, near the city of Thessaloniki, was lashed by heavy rain, hail storms, and gale force winds. A Czech couple died when their caravan was blown away. Two Romanians and two Russians also died. A seventh body was later found in the sea. Officials say at least 100 others were injured in the natural disaster, and 23 people have been hospitalized. Greece has declared a state of emergency in the area. Dozens of rescue workers have been dispatched to help. Tourists have been sharing stories of their ordeal. I'm very, very sad. We are coming here six years and we want to come next year again. And I hope it will be so good. Everyone inside was screaming. It was chaos. A friend of my brother was wounded from top to bottom because the bar fell on him. There was glass everywhere in the air from the windows. Yes, it was a very big storm. Um, it was very frightful because uh, there was a big wind and ice. And a very big rain. World Population Day is observed on July the 11th every year. The day is meant to shift the focus towards the urgency and the significance of issues related to population. The UN estimates that in the next 30 years, the global population will expand by another 2 billion people. The planet's population today currently stands at 7.7 .7 billion people. But while other countries are advocating for population growth, Egypt is doing the opposite promoting birth control to fight the rapid population growth. CGTN's Yasha Hakim has the details. Rhonda Ferris is a coordinator at the Two Is Enough media campaign. It's a lifeline campaign aimed at creating awareness that two kids are enough for each family. She says it's a tough mission. As the government estimates the population could increase to 128 million by 2030 from the current 99 million. Our campaign includes direct awareness programs with families through partnerships with 92 NGOs on the ground. There's a door knock campaign targeting the poor villages where birth rates are the highest. In addition to an extensive media campaign, we also provide birth control pills and services for free. Our motto for them is why divide our expenses and food on five kids instead of two. Contrary to the norm, the economic recession of the last 10 years has not slowed down the birth rate in Egypt. According to the state statistics agency CAPMAS, there was a newborn every five seconds in the North African country in 2018. Many Egyptians feel a big family is a sign of pride. They send kids to work at an early age to bring income to the family. This problem is mainly in poor and conservative segments where they misinterpret Islamic teachings, thinking that having many children is a holy thing. There have been different failed campaigns in the last three decades to reduce birth rates. Two is enough campaign could yield better results. 16% of women we contacted have responded and are on birth control programs. There's about 224,000 women. We are targeting the average number of children per family to drop from 4.6 to 2.4 kids per family by 2013. The government is desperate to reduce birth rates as the fast-growing population is eating out economic growth of the country. 
It's also hard for Egyptians to feel the effects of economic reforms and the social services provided by the government. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. A new UN report estimates that out of an estimated population of 9.7 billion people in the world by 2050, half of the population will be concentrated in just nine countries, one of which is the Democratic Republic of Congo. The growth forecast comes amid a humanitarian crisis and an Ebola outbreak in the DRC. CGTN's Chris Ochamringa has that report from Kinshasa. <laughs> Bankita Iyeni and his wife are parents of 10 children. They live on the outskirts of Kinshasa with their grandchildren. Extended families are a common feature in the DRC capital, given the high costs of living. But the couple is finding it difficult to provide basic needs for their large family. Some of my children left their little kids with us. We struggle to take care of them because we don't have a steady income. I have no job, nothing at all. Our grandchildren need to go to school, but we can't afford to pay their fees. This family is among many in the DRC that struggle to make ends meet. According to the latest UN estimates, the DRC has a population of 86 million people. That figure is expected to increase significantly over the next three decades. The UN has listed the DRC among nine nations where half of the world's population growth will be concentrated by 2050. A Congolese consultant says the country's large population wouldn't be a problem if it were matched with projects that boost the economy. Congo really doesn't have really a grave strategic concern with regard to uh, demographic growth. Uh, on the contrary, it is an asset, and Congo has got sufficient land, uh, and sufficient water, and capacity uh, to produce resources to deal with that. And on the contrary, Congo does have surplus to attract, to help Africa. The only problem right now is that the new president, uh, so far, in terms of strategic planning, has not yet pronounced uh, the idea of his game-changing uh, projects. President Felix Tshisekedi announced a $304 million program during his first 100 days, targeting key sectors that would spur economic growth. But it remains to be seen whether it will transform the country with its rapidly growing population. The UN has urged the DRC and other countries with high fertility levels to find solutions to their growing populations. The DRC's population growth forecast comes weeks after the World Food Programme described the country as the second largest hunger crisis in the world after Yemen. That, coupled with the unrest in the northeast and an Ebola outbreak, presents yet another problem that the country will have to deal with. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Nigeria is another country whose population is expected to double in the next few years, with a growth of more than 3% a year. Earlier, we spoke to Achike Chude, an analyst on African affairs based in Lagos, Nigeria. Let's listen in on what he had to say about this issue. You cannot define population outside of the resources, the natural resources and the human resources of countries because population itself could be a major advantage. It is not for nothing that countries like China today, of course, the most populated country I mean, in the world, but yet it, it, China is said to be a, a world power, economic power, very, very soon in spite of the population. So in as much as you acknowledge the problem with population that we need to do something to curtail it to some extent. But the reality is that if we use the resources of these countries, you know, as they should be used, if we show capability in using all of these resources, then there is no doubt that today we will not be sitting down, we'll be, we'll be, we will not be sitting down, you know, today to talk about the problem of population growth in Nigeria or in the DRC. You know, because we have not been able to, you know, harness our economic resources, I mean, the country is richly endowed, and I think it is, just, it is a coincidence that uh, the two of the nations that uh, the United Nations has singled out, you know, uh, for this advice are two of the richest countries, potentially richest countries, with both human and natural resources in the continent. And so, obviously, because we have, we have had a you know, political leadership that has not been conscious, 
you know, of its responsibilities and has not been able to carry out its duties to, the, to its people. So we have, you know, the you know, very heavy burden of a burgeoning population that, you know, is supported by very little economic growth. And, econ you know, so the lives of the people have been impacted heavily. We do not have jobs. With factories are not working. We have problems in the energy sector. In virtually every segment of the national lives of the citizens of this country, there are all sorts of problems. And simply because, you know, uh, the burden of, you know, not having of uh, you know visionary leaders who are committed to the country and who will use the resources of the country both natural and human for the good of the of the country this has impaired negatively you know on the people and has created unnecessary burden you know on the people and this has security implication some of you know the uh, insurgency activities and the violence that we have in all parts of the country are motivated by economic factors the Intergovernmental Authority on Development is stepping up efforts to mediate a Kenyan-Somali maritime dispute. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who is the current chair of EGAD, has sent emissaries to both countries. Sources say Abiy has been working behind the scenes to broker a truce amid pressure from key international players like the U.S. and the U.K. For years, Kenya and Somalia have been arguing over where a sea border should lie. The disputed triangle off the coast of the Indian Ocean supposedly has large deposits of oil and gas. Earlier this week, the EGOD set up a meeting for the 13th of July between Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta and his Somali counterpart, Mohamed Formajo. It's unclear if either has accepted the invitation. The East Africa trade bloc is seeking a resolution that does not worsen the fragile diplomatic ties in the Horn of Africa. There are fears, though, that the maritime dispute could undermine cooperation in the fight against terrorism and sea piracy in the Horn of Africa. All right, CGTN's Abdulaziz Billo has been following developments in this standoff between Kenya and Somalia, and he now joins us on the phone from Mogadishu. Oh, thank you for joining us, Abdulazi, on Africa Live. First things first, what has been Mogadishu's response to these latest attempts by EGOD chairman to broker a settlement between Kenya and Somalia? Abdulaziz? Well, um, uh, as you've mentioned, Somalia has not yet uh, ruled out uh, the possibility of uh, a meeting in Addis Ababa between uh, President Formaggio and President Kenyatta of uh, Kenya. But then again, what Somalia has ruled out is uh, the fact that uh, there will be no out-of-court settlement regarding a maritime dispute in the Indian Ocean that has been a bone of contention that has caused a diplomatic standoff between Kenya and uh, Somalia. But then again, it's not the first time that uh, the president of Somalia and the Kenyan president uh, with the, the mediation efforts of uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed of Ethiopia will be meeting. They met in uh, March uh, uh, earlier this year in Nairobi, where President Farmajo, accompanied by Prime Minister Abiy, came to a uh, state house in Nairobi to meet President Uhuru Kenyatta. But it seems uh, that uh, the two leaders did not reach an amicable agreement on how to end uh, the diplomatic uh, dispute that stands between the two countries. But then again, Somalia says it welcomes any mediation efforts between the two countries, provided that it does not include uh, the pulling out of the uh, maritime dispute that is now uh, at the International Court of Justice that, wait, that is waiting uh, a, a verdict in uh, the coming uh, months or earlier next year. But Somalia welcomes any mediatory role to end uh, the standoff between Kenya and uh, Somalia and uh, so that close cooperation between the two can uh, continue. So the main contention that uh, created this dispute in the first place is an oil and gas conference that did take place in London on the 7th of February. Kenya insists that Somalia auctioned oil and gas blocks in a disputed territory, but Somalia says that as long as the ICJ does, uh, rules out, uh, uh, rule gives the verdict rather, that's when it's going to auction these blocks. But for now, it says it has kept off these uh, areas, and it's what it, it is what uh, Somalia wants Kenya uh, to believe. All right, Abdulazi, you mentioned oil and gas. Explain to us. Break it down, if you will, why this maritime border is such a critical issue for Somalia. Well, one thing to note is that uh, Somalia is uh, slowly coming out of uh, decades of uh, conflict, and it wants to exert uh, pressure on its uh, territory. For years, it was not able to control its uh, waters and its uh, land. And this is one major, one litmus test, uh, rather, that Somalia wants to prove that it's indeed in control of its own territorial uh, space, 
be it uh, land, air, and uh, sea. But uh, it, the important thing uh, now, apart from Somalia exerting pressure on its territory, is the disputed territory itself. It, uh, according to surveys that were done by different Western uh, companies, it proves that uh, these disputed area contains uh, uh, rich reserves of oil and uh, natural gas and it's one thing that Somalia wants to tap uh, into that sector so that it can kick start its uh, weak economy and create uh, job opportunities for the country's uh, young people so uh, and also the, the issue of uh, the case that is now at the international court of justice most Somalis are keenly following the developments uh, going on between Kenya and uh, Somalia and it wants that case uh, resolved at the ICJ. So for now, uh, what is making this case and this territory very important, for one, it has political uh, significance to Somalia because the former president of Somalia, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, is the one who presented this case to ICJ. And this current government now under President Farmajo uh, also increased the pressure on ICJ to give a verdict regarding this maritime uh, dispute. So many people are following these developments and for Somalia to pull out of this uh, agreement and focus on out-of-court settlement uh, literally will be a political suicide for the current uh, government that is going to go into elections in uh, 2020. And this is one want to brag about that uh, they presented the case to ICJ and most likely maybe the ICJ will rule in Somalia's favor. And this will be a boost for uh, the election of uh, 2021 where, Prime Minister, uh, where President Farmajo will likely be a candidate. So it has significance on both uh, politics and economy. So it's a very sensitive issue currently in Somalia. All right, Abdelaziz Billo talking to us from Mogadishu. Thank you for your insights and thank you for sharing your perspective. Well, the news continues on Africa Live and it's now over to Panina who has our business headlines. Panina. Thank you, Richard. Coming up on Africa Live Business. Online sports betting firms in Kenya take a hit as government orders Safaricom to cut their mobile money payments. And tourism revenues in Tunisia rise by more than 40% in the first half of 2019. Business in Africa is at the crossroads where opportunity meets innovation where profitable new markets collide with global trends. From the sound of an African bell on a stock market floor to the shout of the trader in a bustling free market. It's colorful, vibrant and exotic. CGTN stands at the gateway to Europe, Africa and the Middle East. From Morocco to South Africa, we talk to the dealmakers and actors who fuel its engines of growth. Only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Tourism revenues in Tunisia rose by about 42.5% in the first half of 2019, standing at 692 million US dollars compared to the same period last year. The country's economy is currently reassuring tourists after twin suicide bombings targeting security forces struck the country's capital. The attack killed a patrol officer and injured at least eight people. Adnan Shawashi has the details. Less than two weeks after the suicide bombing in downtown Tunis, authorities announced that the country's tourism revenues have not been affected but have rather soared 42.5% in the first half of 2019 to $692 million compared to the same period last year. The Tunisian government crisis management has been exceptional. There have been no cancellation or rally departures. The conditions are perfect for a good season. Tunisia is a peaceful country. The occupancy rate of hotels in some beach resorts ranges between 95% and 100%. In the last week of June, an increase of 9.3% compared to the same period last year. This five-star hotel is located in the coastal city of Hammamet. The occupancy rate is 100% until January 2020. There are many advantages for which tourists spend their holidays in Tunisia. It's close to many European countries. The climate is very attractive because it's a sunny escape 365 days per year. 
people also come for the quality of our service. Authorities predict that bookings will continue at the same pace until next fall. The season kicked off by a remarkable comeback of the classic European markets. Honestly, there is everything here. The service, the quality, the people are kind. I've never had any problem in this country. I've been to many cities and beach resorts. The holiday in Tunisia is exceptional. Par contre, celui-ci, il est exceptionnel. Since January 2019 up to June 30, the tourist areas of Sous recorded a 5.2% increase in the occupancy rate of hotels, 15.6% of the number of tourists and 17.4% of nights. Four years ago, Tunisia was deserted by foreigners following a wave of terrorist attacks that killed 39 tourists in the same beach resort of Sous and 21 people at the Barda Museum in Tunis. Tourism accounts for 8% of Tunisia's GDP. Experts consider it as the pillar of the country's economy. The Ministry of the Interior has deployed thousands of agents at beach resorts, hotels and tourist areas. The new security strategy aims to guarantee the safety of millions of foreign tourists who will visit Tunisia this year. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN. Tunis. Egypt has inaugurated an airport for the new capital located 70 kilometers to the east of Cairo. The Capital International Airport aims to replace Cairo, which has become a traffic-clogged urban sprawl of more than 20 million people. The airport was opened one month ago on trial basis to service the city, which will become the country's new capital from mid-2020. The airport will operate with an hourly capacity of 300 passengers during the trial phase. A third airport, the Sphinx International Airport, also opened in January. The two new airports are aimed at helping boost tourism, a key sector in Egypt and a major source of foreign revenue. The importance of the capital airport is that it partially eases the pressure on Cairo International Airport and Springs Airport to be a new outlet for Cairo specifically. We are operating as part of a trial period which will last for a month. During this month, we revise all the operational requirements, safety precautions and all the security precautions. By the end of the trial period, we will evaluate the whole period and accordingly take the decision to start actual operation. Currently in this first phase, it accommodates up to 300 passengers, but this is only the first phase. As explained by the aviation minister, anything in the world starts small and has the capacity to be expanded. As you saw upon entering the airport, it has a high potential for expansion. In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa has reappointed Leseja Kanyago as governor of the South African Reserve Bank. Kanyago will serve another five years, effective from November 9th this year. The South African brand firmed up in early trading against the dollar as the appointment signaled continuity. Ramaphosa also appointed Fundi Shazibana and Rashad Kasim as deputy central bank governors for five years each, effective the 1st of August. The new appointments come at a time when the bank is expected to cut in interest rates by a quarter of a percent next week. Economists in the country assigned a median 60 percent probability rates would be cut on July 18th, even though inflation is expected to average 4.5 percent this year, which is the center of the bank's 3 percent to 6 percent target range. In many African countries, trading across borders often involves going through a third currency. If you're buying oil from Nigeria, an air ticket to west, north, or South Africa, most likely you'll have to pay in the U.S. dollar. The Afroxim Bank estimates that this ends up costing the continent 5 billion U.S. dollars a year. And to solve it, some countries are trying to switch to a common currency, like the ECO in ECOWAS. In others, common payment systems are being established. But are crypto systems like Facebook's Libra an alternative? CGTN's Ramanyang put that question to the president of the African Development Bank. Well, the thing is that we got to make sure digital payments you were talking about. Yeah. I mean, take a look at what has happened in digital payments world today. It didn't actually come from the West. It actually came out, came out of Africa. It came right up your country, actually, uh, 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 with the MPES that, that was done. And so for us as uh, African Development Bank, 
we are investing more in digital payment systems. Digital payment systems are going to fast track transactions within the continental free areas, no doubt about it. It's also going to be very critical as you look at financial inclusion, especially for women. You know, it's going to help tremendously also in terms of security, personal security. Most of the trade that's actually going to be done or being done and more is going to be done off uh, in the years coming is actually in the informal sector. And so the more people carry cash, you know, and people get mugged and so on uh, and, and taken advantage of. So digital payments are going to reduce their transaction costs and obviously give them also quite a lot of security when they have to actually trade uh, across borders. And in particular, it's going to be very critical to move in the informal trade more to the formal trade as well. Kenya has ordered telecoms firm Safaricom to stop processing payments for sports betting companies. Leti Wambua, who is the acting director of the Regulator Betting Control and Licensing Board, told Safaricom that licenses for all 27 betting firms had not been renewed pending the outcome of an ongoing inquiry about their suitability to operate in the country. Online sports betting companies such as Sport Pesa have grown rapidly in the East African nation in recent years, contributing revenue of two billion billion US dollars last year. However, that has sparked concern in the government about the social impact of betting. In May, the country introduced new gambling regulations, including banning advertising outdoors and on social media. 2019 marks the 40th anniversary of the establishment of China-US diplomatic relations, and Shanghai is holding a series of events to celebrate the occasion. Mijai spoke to several US businesses in Shanghai to find out what's on their minds over four decades of economic cooperation across the Pacific. Psych GM is one of the biggest China-US joint ventures in Shanghai. The two partners first started their business 22 years ago and now have 13 factories in four major regions of the country. The joint venture has introduced a variety of vehicles into the Chinese market, from affordable family cars to luxury brands. Saik GM has experienced firsthand the business advances over the past four decades and just this year opened a new Cadillac house in Shanghai's Pudong district the first outside the United States, which they are happy to show off to visitors. And then this, this facility in of itself is, um, is, is an extension of the relationship and partnership that we're trying to develop with our customers here. Uh, you've just walked through an amazing facility uh, that prospective customers and current customers will be able to enjoy as we bring great events, art events, music events, and, and things that will be in keeping with their expectations. So we want this to be very special for Cadillac customers, and we think we've created something that they're really going to appreciate. Coca-Cola has also been a witness to the development of the China-U.S. relations. The company was among the first U.S. firms to enter the China market after the two countries established diplomatic relations in 1979. It shipped more than 3,000 bottles of Coca-Cola to Beijing in January of that year in a deal with Kafka and set up its own plant in Beijing in 1982. Now the company has more than 40 factories across the country with one of its biggest bottling plants located in Shanghai. Well, our business has started out where it was really a very small business and now it's now our third largest business in the world soon to be one day our second largest business in the world as china china becomes more of a consumer centric country you're going to see huge expansion while the outward global economic environment may be changing foreign firms in china are looking forward to continued cooperation between chinese and u.s firms and improving business and economic results we all hope that the uh, current um, economic environment and between China and the U.S. will improve and become blossom in the next uh, the next few years, given the changes that are taking place with uh, Mr. Xi and Mr. Trump's conversations. And we uh, look forward to that being a successful outcome, which I'm sure it will. So it's a matter of how we can uh, develop different industries and widen the scope. And I think that this is what uh, Mr. Xi wants to do, is to open up China and Shanghai and develop uh, the door and, and interact more with um, foreign uh, companies and countries and that, that's very exciting for everybody. The United States is now China's biggest trading partner. The trade volume between the two countries has grown more than 230 times to more than 630 billion US dollars over the past four decades. Mi Jianyi, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. 
We'll leave it there for now on Africa Live Business. But coming up on Global Business, Central Bank in Egypt sets new interest rates. We have the details live from Cairo at the top of the hour. I shall see you then. For now, Richard, back to you. Thank you, Panina. You are watching Africa Live on CGTN. We have so much more wonderful, amazing, and inspiring stories coming your way. Let's take a sneak peek at what's coming up. A gym in California uses human energy from workouts to generate electricity. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. Welcome back. A gym in California is harnessing human workout energy and turning it into electricity so as to power the facility. The fitness center has installed a non-motorized treadmill and several upright cycles made by Washington-based equipment manufacturer Sports Art. Here is CGTN's Daniel Arup Moy with more on the details. The Sacramento Echo Fitness has installed several upright cycles made by Washington-based equipment manufacturer Sports Art. The cardio machines have inbuilt inverters similar to those found on solar panels and wind turbines which turn the watts generated during a workout into electricity. The electricity produced is then used to power the gym. Any excess electricity produced is sent to a battery to keep the lights on during off-peak hours. I uh, have somebody right now exercising, but while they're exercising and burning calories, they're actually able to produce watts, which we use that energy to power the facility itself. Antonio says a spin class on stationary cycles produces between 1,000 and 2,500 watts. His gym also owns a treadmill, which is self-powered and uses electromagnetic and mechanical braking system to generate power. The machine uses no power. It only moves when someone steps on it and pushes the belt around. Many of the members at this fitness facility say they joined the gym purely because they liked the echo cardio machines. Well, working in the environmental testing industry, it's really important to me that everything is environmentally conscious. So combining fitness and something that's, you know, of course, really good for you and the environment is just probably one of the best ideas that anybody could ever come up with. <laughs> For Avina, his self-powered gym is only the beginning. He hopes that someday gyms will be able to power an entire city on their own by producing enough energy through workout sessions. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN. And we are not done just yet. We've got your sports news coming up after the break. Here's a sneak peek at the headline. Madagascar hoping to keep their fairy tale run alive against Tunisia tonight. 